Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop. I'm here with Matt from Scholar Gladiatoria today, and we're just looking at some sword scabbards that I've made. Um, Matt's done another fantastic video, sort of all about them in terms of how they're worn. So we'll just look at structurally a little bit more uh, at how they're, they're made and uh, sort of certain features of them, really. So we're going to start historically back at the beginning here. Uh, so we've got sort of a 12th century-ish scabbard based on um, an Albion sword, Albion Arn sword. Now, there's a few different ways that you can do scabbards. Back in the um, Victor uh, Viking times, so Victorian, back in the Viking times, they used to line their scabbards, usually with fleece, sometimes with um, fur or wool. What is interesting, actually, is that if the hairs on the fleece were pointing upwards, obviously it would make it hell to get your sword in. Um, equally, if they're pointing down, um, that works okay and you can get your sword in, it's not so good for coming out. But it does appear that actually they tended to put the hairs running sideways up the, up the fleece. Um, the scabbard core itself, back in uh, migration era in Viking times, tended to be a, a slat, a lath of wood, front and back, but nothing on the sides. Now, by this point, in sort of this medieval period, the scabbard cores were generally not lined. So they weren't lined with wool or, or fur, they were just plain wood, and they were actually carved out. So you start with two thicker pieces of wood, you carve the shape of the, the blade into that, you effectively hold it, clamp it together, and then you shape it down. Um, you can also do it uh, by doing it with veneers, so very thin strips of wood that you form, um, uh, you form them wet onto the sword blade, you bind that and then bond it. Um, but this one here has been done with two scabbard cores, two sides. It's lashed with an integrated scabbard uh, system. We were trying them earlier and, and actually this, I mean, you made some interesting points, Matt, about um, uh, how it allows you to sort of replace bits if they break and, and how scabbards effectively were not an item for life, you know. I think it's interesting as well that it's all the work of a leather worker. And so yeah. there's, no, there's no specialist buckles or metal bits that are required to, to mm. attach this, you know. So maybe replaceable, you know, replaceableness plays a part in that. Yeah, I think it does, and, and, and cheapness as well, effectively. It's not this sort of scabbard, which goes with the era, you know, the sort of like very austere uh, warrior monks. It's, it's not going to be a very expensive scabbard. Um, simple bronze horseshoe shape um, that's beaten from flat sheet. Uh, but yeah, just a nice scabbard. And then we come to the next one, which is sort of a variation on the theme, really. Um, but again, it's sort of a, a Z pattern, I'd call it. But again, an integrated belt. Um, and you can see how uh, at all points the strapping passes through the scabbard and that holds it all together. Um, but again, I love these. I've always loved Type 14 swords. It's yeah, and it's, it seems a really a simple solution. Um, I think these can look complicated to people who don't understand mm. how they're made, but when you actually start looking at them up close, you can uh, you can see that actually it's a fairly simple system. But this is this is almost ornamental, isn't it? And it's I mean it's, yeah. it's functional, but they thought of a way of doing it so it looks more. It it elaborate. does, and I mean you could do it like this, or you could just lace it in and out like almost a stitch pattern. It wouldn't matter. But then sometimes you see it with sort of like tassels coming down at this point, and it does it allows a little bit of creative freedom, yeah. you know. And there, I think this type is super comfortable and super kind of, um, it very much stays in place. It's mm. not going anywhere, is it? Mm. So, um, yeah, it's a really, really good solution for, for how do you keep a sword out of the way and it's in the place where it needs to be easily, uh, quickly, quickly drawable um, mm. at a good height and it, you're not going to, you know, knock into lots of things. I mean, it's a relatively short sword, so you don't have yeah. a lot of problems with uh, no, I mean, you're actually yeah. wearing it quite high there as well, yeah, actually, yeah. but um, sort of, I, I always yeah. think of like a Western yeah. gunslinger, you know. Right, it's, yeah, more down there. Yeah, you've got to okay. walk more like a gangster, you know, <coughs> to carry right. it Cause, off. Because in, the, in uh, the manuscripts of the period, they're often shown kind of sagging a bit, aren't mm, they, like mm. that, so. Well, it helps to keep it more stable as well, actually. Yeah. Um, that uh, just sort of the way it sits there allows it to move. Because also, don't forget, when you do knock into things, and you will knock into things, yeah. if it is absolutely rigidly held, that's <laughs> yeah. a pain as well. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you want some movement with it. Yeah. Um, but you don't want it to flick about all the time. 
So it's and, kind of an interesting balance. And of course, the other thing you definitely don't want is getting on and off horses or going up mm. and down things. You don't want it to, to tilt forward in such a way that your sword might fall out. Yeah. As you can see in some, some movies uh, where, where the <laughs> swords are sliding. Up and so it keeps it, it keeps it angled upwards in a very safe and secure way. It, it does, actually. Can I borrow that one yeah. off you, Matt? Um, but it is interesting when you... I've got this, this thing. I mean, you know, that sits nicely if I turn <laughs> that upside down. You know, it's yeah. there. Yeah. That's great. And this is actually what the market wants. They want a scabbard that goes in and it's nice and it's smooth and you put it there and you go, oh, positive fit, lovely, no rattle, great. I ask if that's right, actually, because it's what I, I, I do and it's what the market wants. But actually, if you, you know, we all know that wood swells, right, when it gets wet. Yeah. So, you know, if you're out on comp campaign for four days, riding through the rain and, it, you know, this scabbard is going to be dripping wet inside and out. And actually, at that point, you know, your scabbard might be jammed, your sword jammed absolutely tight in the scabbard. Yeah. And it wouldn't surprise me because just a little bit of, of change in, in moisture could stop your sword going in like that and you have to sort of tap it around. But the market wants something, but I'm not sure if it was ever historically like that. I, I actually wonder if, um, if a lot of these swords were kept relatively greased in their scabbards. I think they probably were. Um, yeah. Because obviously that's better for preserving the steel of the blade, um, preventing rust, but also importantly, I know of at least one account uh, from later centuries where someone tried to pull their scabbard, uh, pull their sword out of the scabbard quickly and some rust had formed and it had basically locked it into mm. the scabbard mm. so they couldn't. Um, so from a personal protection uh, point of view, it's better if you've got a bit of grease in there. And it might get over this this point that you mentioned about if the, if the scabbard gets soaked and it gets mm. soaked inside, well, if the blade's covered in grease, I won't say it won't matter, but it won't matter as much. It won't. It's critical. But I think, you know, going back to your Hollywood guy of the sword falling out, yeah. I think that's just dreadful sword scabbardness, you know, because, yeah. you know, even, let's just find, okay, so that one, that fits. Okay, it's there, but it doesn't take much to get that one out, right? So that's relatively loose. But actually, for that to fall out, I mean, it's got you're there, before, yeah, you know, yeah. before you're in trouble sort of thing. So it's just, I think it's, it's lousy Hollywood scabbards more than anything Yeah, else. it's because they tend yeah. to be attached at one point, I think. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. all it takes is for that pommel to get pushed or the back end of the, yeah. the, the sword to get pushed and it goes upside down. Yeah. So if we look at the next one here, and this is uh, interesting, you made a point earlier on this, which I had never seen, but this is, one thing to, to think about here is this is garish as you like. I mean, that is, I'm going to say it here, pretty unpleasant. But if you're like medieval, <laughs> but if you're medieval, the fact that it's flowers, there's nothing non-manly about that. You know, in our world, you know, flowers are feminine, you know, but it's not. You know, you'll have hearts, you'll have flowers on your stuff. You know, it's, that's not a problem. What you're doing is you're displaying your wealth, you're displaying your, your power, your money. And this kind of garishness, you can't walk into a dark room and miss that. <laughs> You've seen that sword scabbard. Yeah. And that's what you want, you know, that's... that's you want to show that off. So you've got layers of money here. You've got, okay, these are just polished bronze, but they'd probably be gilded in reality. You've got uh, leather over a wooden core, nice fitting scabbard, that's money. You've got leather carving, which is money, and then onto the carving you've applied the paintwork, you know. So it's these, these layers of money of displaying the wealth that you've got. But this is sort of very typical of sort of effigies of the end of the 14th, but... What's interesting here, and this is a point that, that Matt made to me earlier, which is quite funny, is firstly, it is hanging down and these angles do help to keep it reasonably still. So that's all right. But it's pretty impractical. You know, the, that is a much better position to wear yeah. a sword in. But as, as Matt said, that it never occurred to me, is um, when you bend down to pick something up, if you've got a sword scabbard on like this, you're now immediately in trouble because basically if I bend down, it hits the ground and I end up with a pommel in the armpit and actually it quite hurts, <laughs> even when you're doing it gently. So if I was doing something quick, um, that well, would, I, that I, would kill actually, me. You know? and, I, and I've done this on, on, um, on grass, uh, muddy, muddy yeah. grass, and the end of the scabbard will actually bury itself right. in the grass as well, so yeah. it's sort of double whammy. But yeah, so that's, a, that's a funny one. I mean, it, it is completely over the top and is meant to be over the top. Um, but the sort of thing that you see on effigies very, very much. Um, and then the next one, very simply, the construction method again is all the same. I've done lovely veneer ones with these. Um, this is from, from planks, but uh, middle of the um, 14th century, we start finding sort of metal hangers like this at the midpoint and at the throat. Um, 
That system carries on, so basically that end of the hook will just hook onto your belt at the back, um, roughly over the small of your back, uh, and then that one, the end of the belt passes through. So you've now got a nice secure thing. Um, you have a nice angle on the sword, which is handy. Uh, but the problem with that is it's non-adjustable because all these points are riveted. So really, that was superseded fairly rapidly. Not completely disappeared, but other systems came in, like this one, which has now got these scabbard knots. Principally, what this really allows you to do is to adjust the length of those belts, and that allows you to start to change the angle that this is all supported at and how it works. Um, with all of these scabbards, you see things here, and you see it on the sort of the living history, the reenactment market, the scabbard makers market, of set patterns. And like anything else in medieval times, you know, like a bollock dagger, they would follow a flow, they'd follow a direction, but there weren't absolute recipes, there weren't absolute instructions. So, you know, these are the kind of layouts you had, but whether straps were in one place or another, it doesn't, doesn't really matter too much. Um, and then finally, we're going to end on a, a Renaissance piece, which... Um, has now changed significantly. So, yes, of course, the blade has changed significantly as well in terms of it's now a rapier, which is a very different object. But we have a hanger here, which again, the hook just passes through a belt. But now, rather than the suspension being over your butt at the back, I don't know why particularly, it's now brought over the, to the front, and that's where you get your stability from. But yeah, you were talking about um, Sam Brown earlier on, we were having a chat, and, and you were saying about Indian Mutiny type times they were suspending the sword only from above well, which yeah, i find really much, weird yeah pretty much like this so, so it comes goes all the way back to you know um cavalry sabers of the 18th century that were suspended from the strap just by two by two mm. straps to two separate points um and they do swing around a lot and for that very reason in pictures you see often people actually holding their right. swords um and you could hook them up um, so um, on horseback this was primarily for it didn't matter because they would just yeah. jangle around here they'd be loose free to swing around um, but on foot you'd then uh, hook that up to there um, but the problem was was they found that drawing the uh, sword out you had to have this hand free to stabilize mm. the scabbard so you could then draw the sword out um, but obviously you don't always have both hands free and Sam Brown uh, lost an arm and so he invented this way, this slightly new You would have thought that would be enough to, inval uh, to invalid you out, but <laughs> clearly uh, well, yeah. loss, loss of an arm didn't stop you. But well, yeah. I think that, yeah, I think he was still, you know, a serving officer mm. and he still felt that he had to, mm. uh, had to wear a sword. And, um, on parade, you still had to draw it mm. this kind of stuff. So, um, so essentially he intro introduced a new way of attaching the, um, the sword to the, to the belt. Incidentally, the Sam Brown belt, it seems, predates Sam Brown uh, right. because they were already shown in photographs from the mutiny. So there's, anyway, that's, mm. that's another topic. But the, the idea was that you could draw the sword without having yeah. to hold it with your spare hand. And, and most of these you can, actually. It's, yeah, um, of I, all of them, this is the one that, that requires you to have two hands more than any, I think. Very so. much so. I think that's, which is curious when you consider mm. it's usually one with the dagger yes because you'd think that if, if you're yeah. pulling the dagger out with your left hand you want to be able to draw the sword out with one hand well that yes because because it's a, the supporting strap is at the front yeah the whole thing will move forward if you try and pull it back whereas if they had put the supporting strap at the back it would hold the scabbard there so yeah. but there must be a reason they did it but i, I personally um. find of, of these the the earlier the earlier type are the ones that if i just hold it as if mm. it was tied up there uh, they they seem to come out the most easily with one hand without having to hold yeah. the scabbard at all. Yeah. Uh, and as you go later in period, I won't say this is a universal rule, but as you go later in period, and certainly the one that hangs vertically, seem to have more issues with drawing the sword single-handedly. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if the, the vertical hang is more of a, a dress piece than a, a military piece in a way. Maybe, but, yeah. Um, um, and we were talking about that earlier and it should feature in, in the video on my channel, I mm. think. But... Yeah, but it does seem to me almost like some of the earlier styles of um, scabbard are almost more utilitarian and more practical. Mm. And other aspects of, um, well, of design came in as you go through. Well, actually, more and more, the further you go back, the more likely they are to have a shield in their left hand as well. Yep, absolutely. Um, so they so that could be part of it. Necessarily mm. physically free up the... Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's true. And, and the context where a sword might be drawn in the earlier period is 
when just at the moment when your spear has either lodged in someone's shield or you've thrown it, yeah. and you need to very quickly get a sword out from behind, like you say, mm. from behind the shield. So, yes, absolutely. Part and um, parcel of the same thing. Part of the same stuff. Technology. But anyway, thank you very much. Always good to chank chat to you, you, Matt. Thank yeah. you. Cheers. Cheers.